Greetings, Brookings Bio students. This is Mrs. Rydell, and in this uh, slideshow, we're going to take a look at uh, chapter 15, which is um, a chapter that has to do with uh, Darwin and his theory that he came up with about the origin of species, the um, theory of evolution. And we're going to start out by talking a little bit about Darwin and how he came up with the theory and eventually um, look at some kinds of evidence that support the idea of, of evolution. Um, if you remember back to past chapters, we talked about this idea um, in our environment chapters, and we talked about it in classification chapter. It's been a vocab word for the past few uh, chapters, and it has to do with the idea of all the different organisms that live on our planet in the biosphere. Um, lots of different species of organisms, and um, when we start thinking about biodiversity, it leads to some questions. Where did all these different organisms come from? And, and how are they related to each other? We talked about that a little bit in our last chapter on classification. And those were questions that, um, that kind of came to Darwin as he was traveling around the world. We're going to talk about his voyage a little bit. But um, at the time, that he called it the mystery of mysteries. Where did all um, the, where do, where do new species come from? Where did all the different kinds of life that we see on our planet, where did all these different kinds of organisms come from? Um, and and he eventually uh, figured it out. He came up with an explanation and a theory about how new species um, come to be. And we're going to talk about that. So if you think about coming up with a scientific theory or an explanation of something, one of the things that we want to, to answer that question of where did living things come from, we use um, the scientific method, looking at um, scientific facts, uh, collecting evidence, making observations, and eventually putting those ideas together to make a hypothesis about what um, what is going on and where where did all the um, different species on our planet come from? And ultimately, um, came to be a part of what we call the theory of evolution, evolutionary theory. And that's what this chapter is about. We're going to look at the scientific evidence and see uh, what evidence there is to support the theory of evolution. And um, we're going to look a little bit at the, um, in this part of the slideshow, just at Charles Darwin and who he um, was and how he actually uh, collected evidence to come up with this theory. Um, and Darwin is really the person who, he's not the first person to um, come up with the idea that living things change over time. Remember, that was one of our um, things we learned in chapter one when we talked about what are some characteristics of living things that as a group they change over time. He wasn't the first person to come up with that idea, but he's um, contri uh, really contributed the most to our understanding about how evolution works. He's the guy who actually came up with the mechanism to explain how this worked. And so that's why we kind of um, give him the credit for for this theory. We're going to talk about some other people who influenced his thinking in, um, in our next slideshow. Um, so he was born in the 1800s. Um, Darwin and President uh, Abraham Lincoln have the same birthday, if that kind of puts it in, in a time context for you. Um, and when he was 22 years of age, he had the opportunity of a lifetime to uh, go on a voyage around the world. That was pretty amazing for a, a young kid. He was born in England. Um, he was a, a nature kind of guy. He spent a lot of time outdoors collecting bugs and things. He was kind of a nerd. And um, he had the chance to go on this voyage. And um, there was a boat called the Beagle. HMS stands for His Majesty's Ship. And he um, named for a... Um, uh, an admiral in the Navy, not named for a dog. Um, and he got the chance to go on this journey that was going to travel around the world. And this is like a big undertaking. We're talking five years sailing around the world and got to visit a lot of new places and travel to exotic um, countries and see different organisms and had an amazing journey and his job on the boat on the ship was to be what we call a naturalist and was right up Darwin's alley because he loved nature he loved spending time outdoors and collecting specimens and that's what his job was to travel with the boat go where they went 
and um, basically keep a log, keep a diary, write, uh, keep journals of all the things that happened to them, all the things that he saw. Um, he collected specimens as he went to, of different organisms that he had never seen before and people in England had never seen before. Um, and that was his job, um, to go with the boat and be the naturalist. Um, and during his travels now, remember this is a time, 1800s, there's no uh, cell phones, there's no video games, there's no movies, there's no TV, no uh, VCRs to watch. So what do you do on a boat? or um, when you're traveling is, is your entertainment is is yourself you have to come up with things to do and he basically kept a diary kept a journal um, wrote down everything that happened on the journey to, um, to what they saw where they went he drew pictures of the things that he saw the different kinds of organisms he collected specimens and sent them back to England he collected a huge amount of evidence that ultimately when he got back to England and started looking, really this was the beginning of a lifetime of, of research and looking at all of the specimens and um, evidence that he collected that led him ultimately to come up with this hypothesis that was very revolutionary for his time. And the hypothesis to explain how living things change over time. So if you look at his um, trip, he's traveling around the world now, going to amazing places and seeing things that he had never seen before. Here's a young guy out on an adventure. Um, and it, but as he's going, he's thinking and asking these questions. When he goes to different countries, how come they have different animals? Even though they may have a similar ecosystem, they have different animals living in different places. How come there weren't any rabbits in Australia? Remember we... Uh, talked about rabbits as an invasive species when we did our human um, impact chapter. Um, they didn't have any rabbits in Australia at that time. And no kangaroos in England. He saw animals that he had never seen before. And anyone in England had never seen before. We don't have kangaroos in the United States now, except in the zoo. We don't have uh, different kinds of animals he saw that weren't in England. So there are different animals that live in different places. How come there's no kangaroos in England? Why, why aren't there uh, tigers in, in uh, Europe? It's all of, and also as he's traveling, he's seeing fossils and evidence of organisms that don't exist anymore. Where, what happened to these organisms and where did they go and, and how come they disappeared? And, and how are they related to the species that are still alive today? He had all these questions in his mind as he's traveling and seeing all these new things and kind of led to a lifetime of study of trying to figure this out, what was going on. Um, as he was traveling around the world um, on the boat now, he's uh, traveling and he spent about a month observing life on the Galapagos Islands. Galapagos is a small series of islands off the coast of Ecuador in South America. And one of the cool things about islands, because they are unique habitats and um, oftentimes islands form through volcanic activity, which is a volcano erupts and produces lava that hardens into rock. And basically you get an, a land where there was nothing. So islands are kind of habitats that start from scratch, um, nothing living there. And um, they're good places to study, kind of laboratories for studying uh, ecosystems and studying change in organisms because um, oftentimes island habitats have unique animals that don't live any other place. And that's what he discovered when he went to the Galapagos. There were finches, finches are kinds of birds, and tortoises that live on this island, and lots of cool um, birds and things that don't live any other place except on the Galapagos Islands. And allowed him to collect specimens and, and really think about the idea of where did these organisms come from? How did they get to be on the island? Um, the Galapagos are close together, the islands are close together, but they have very different uh, kinds of climates, different kinds of ecosystems there. So um, some islands are very hot and dry, kind of deserty type ecosystems, very little vegetation, not very many plants grow there. Think of, you know, what a desert would be like. Other kinds of uh, other islands in the chain of the Galapagos 
um, have a lot of rainfall and very rich in vegetation, more like rainforest, jungly kind of places. And each island had its own unique assortment of plants and animal species that lived on um, that island. The island uh, tortoises, for example, that lived on Hood Island were different than the tortoises that lived on Isabella or Pinta or Fernanda or the different different kinds of islands. And so it started him thinking about how those tortoises got to be there and how are they related to each other and how come they looked different. If you look at the tortoises that live on the island now, um, the island um, that had a very desert-like ecosystem, Hood Island, um, the tortoises that lived in that place had a very long neck and more of a flattened um, kind of flat shell. And they were different than the tortoises that lived on some of the other islands. If you think about living in a deserty place where you don't have a lot of vegetation, it may be hard to get to the vegetation, having a long neck is going to be an advantage. It's going to allow those turtles to reach for food maybe that they couldn't reach if they had shorter necks and allow them to get food in a place where vegetation is pretty sparse. If you look at the tortoises that live in the rainforest island of Isabella, they had very short necks and more dome-shaped shells. And they didn't have a problem getting food anywhere. They, there was vegetation, high, low, in all kinds of places. They, could, they uh, had the ability to get food easily. And um, having a neck that was short, allowed they could live on this island and, and get the food that they needed. And if you looked at the tortoises that lived on Pinta Island, Pinta Island had an um, ecosystem, a habitat, a climate that was kind of in between Hood and Isabella. It didn't, wasn't dry like a desert, um, like Hood Island. It wasn't a jungly place. There was in between rain, in between climate, in between um, vegetation. And if you looked at the tortoises that lived on that island, they kind of had an in-between uh, neck length. Um, not as long as the deserty uh, tortoises on Hood, not as short as the ones on Isabella Island, um, and seemed perfectly adapted to getting the food that they needed for the place where they were living. So after his voyage, Darwin spent a lot of time thinking about the things that he saw. And he began to wonder if the animals that were living on these different islands in the Galapagos had once been members of the same species. Were they, did they share an ancestor that had changed um, as it moved from island to island into different situations, into different kinds of ecosystems, and become separated from each other enough that they became different over time and, and actually evolved, uh, changed to become uh, different species. Um, and so as Darwin is traveling on the journey now, he's collecting evidence, he's writing down these things, and then he goes back to England and starts thinking about all of the things that he saw. Um, so we're going to watch a little movie about Darwin. And um, So we're going to watch a little movie about Darwin and see what happens to him as after he comes back from his journey. Who was Charles Darwin? Charles Darwin was an English naturalist who was fascinated with nature. but not an ordinary naturalist with an ordinary fascination with nature. Hello? What are you doing here? Why such beauty when no one can see? In 1831, Charles Darwin was only 22 when he began a five-year voyage aboard the British ship HMS Beagle to explore, observe, and study the natural world. The Beagle sailed throughout South America and to remote places like the Galapagos Islands off Ecuador. Darwin later wrote that he felt like a blind man being given sight 
returned to England with his mind and notebooks full of fantastic images. What a brilliant red. Nothing seemed too insignificant for his scrutiny. He kept detailed records of what he saw during his voyage on the Beagle. He collected fossils. He kept detailed recordings of uh, plants and animals. He drew them. He observed them. Little did Darwin realize that his years on the Beagle would begin a lifetime of hard work and controversy. The greatest scientists of Darwin's day referred to the appearance of species originally as the mystery of mysteries. Now, Darwin was an ambitious young man, and he decided to tackle this greatest mystery in the biology of his day. Mountain. Darwin took on the task of unraveling this mystery methodically, with patience and care. Gradually, one simple and elegant idea became more and more clear to him, that all living things are related. It was a conclusion that to Darwin could not be escaped. But he also knew he was in dangerous waters. He rarely shared his thoughts with others, but his brother was an exception. A similarity of structure indicates one thing and one thing only, an ancient common ancestor. Real flesh and blood parents. Why didn't you say so then? Hmm? You must publish your ideas, if only to establish your priority. What's holding you back? You have to understand that Darwin was a respectable man. His father was a well-known physician. He came from a well-known family. He went to Cambridge University to train for the Church of England. And he knew eminent scientists of his day. In Darwin's time, the prevailing explanation for the great diversity of life was a literal interpretation of the Earth's creation as described in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. Established naturalists believe that God created each individual species of animals and plants, usually miraculously, at the beginning, and that these species had stayed fixed. <laughs> we allow the planets and the sun to be governed by natural laws. But the smallest insect, we wish to be created by a special act of God. <laughs> Surely the creation of life has to be explained in the same way as geology, using natural, ordinary, everyday causes. Well, in theory, yes, but in practice, there can be no question about the prime cause, divine will. Shouldn't men of science be free to investigate each and every means by which new species come into being? If by that you mean wild accusations about man's ancestry, the answer is no. He was doing something highly unorthodox in his day. Not unorthodox because it went against the church per se, but because it went against all of natural history in Great Britain. He knew he stood to jeopardize the whole united establishment of science, politics, and the church. He knew that he could get into very, very bad trouble and ruin his career. And yet Darwin also knew the evidence he gathered and the tests he conducted supported the revolutionary idea that living things are related and have changed over millions and millions of years. This new way of thinking was a mark of his genius. It took Darwin 23 years of work to overcome his own doubts to finally present his ideas to the world. His revolutionary book, The Origin of Species, introduced a scientific theory to explain how evolution occurs. He called his mechanism of change natural selection. Darwin had the courage to go against what was believed in those days, and it changed the world in a great, in a profound way. One of the remarkable things about Darwin's contribution that is, I think, too seldom appreciated is he didn't just tell us how we got here. He told us, in a sense, why biology makes sense. The sequences of our genes, the structures of our body, and even our instincts in terms of behavior all make sense and all tie together because of evolution. If I were to give a prize for the single best idea anybody ever had, I'd give it to Darwin for the idea of natural selection. Ahead of Newton, ahead of Einstein, it was Darwin's great stroke to see how to unite the facts about the excellence of design of all the different species. He understood that what he was proposing 
was a truly revolutionary idea. In Westminster Abbey, there is an area called Scientist's Corner. There, in the company of that other revolutionary scientific thinker, Sir Isaac Newton, lies Charles Darwin. Okay, so we saw in the little video um, a little bit about Darwin and how he uh, came to start thinking about the idea of change over time in living things. Um, and we kind of saw that he came back from his voyage and, and spent years um, researching, looking at the evidence he had collected and, and coming up with this idea. And um, in our next little part of our slideshow, um, we're going to see about some of the other influences that Darwin knew about that, that kind of helped him uh, come up with this theory of evolution.